All right. So let us get right into it because we have so much to cover and it's so exciting and we don't want to miss any of it. So we are well into our second movement. In fact, this is the final step, uh, the final part of this chiasm. And you see how it relates to the beginning of chapter four. So these are two parallel parts that Paul has constructed for us. And we'll see that uh, a little bit more as we read on. But let's look at the text together. In your notes, this is page 151. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that y'all will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual of wickedness in the heavenly. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that y'all will be able to resist on the evil day and having done everything, stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having belted y'all's waist with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having strapped on y'all's feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which y'all will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Wow. With every prayer and request, Pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be alert with all perseverance and request for all the saints and in my behalf that speech may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to to speak. So this is just a perfect time to very briefly mention how it is related to chapter 4 verses 1 through 16. In chapter 4 verses 1 through 16, we have Paul calling himself a prisoner. And here we have him calling himself an ambassador of chains. There's a, there's a link there. In that section, he talks about not being tossed about by all these winds of doctrine. Here he talks about standing firm. That's intentional this link. Uh, there he talks about the craft, the, in chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, about the craftiness and deceitful scheming of people. And here he talks about the schemes of the devil. They're related. He talks about the five ministry gifts plus the giver of gifts, that's six. And here there's six pieces of armor. So there's a linkage that's very strong between these two bookends of our beautiful chiasm of the second movement in Ephesians. In this letter, and this is what I hope you take away from this whole study, or one of the things that you take away, that in this letter, when boy, it's getting brighter and brighter, have you noticed? At first I'm like, my vision's getting better, or I'm having an apocalypse. But when we grasp the interlocking examples of these different chiasms of the Old Testament hyperlinks that he's inserted here, all these repeated word occurrences, like just in this passage, he's got five sevens, which you saw in the pre-work, all those sevens. And it's intentional. This is like very strategic. So it's clear that the letter of Ephesians is not just a scribble. It's not somebody down saying, let me, let me just pound out a letter. This is, Paul and his writing team have been inspired by the Holy Spirit to put an enormous amount of thought and intention into this. And it's, it's a work of literary genius 
with Hebrew roots because so much of this type of literature has got its roots in the Hebrew uh, narrative and poetry, but some of it also is connected to just profound Greek rhetoric. It's a work of art. It's a work of art. So the armor of God. What is it? And where did it come from? Just like Paul has talked to the Messianic Jews, referring to them as we, because he's one of them, and he's also talked to the Gentile believers in Jesus, the faithful ones in Jesus Christ, and you know how he's merged these two groups into one living temple, one new humanity in Christ? Now that he's gonna talk about spiritual warfare, do you think he's gonna leave out either group? He is, he is going to talk language that makes sense to both groups. And it's almost like two sides of a coin. So first I wanna evaluate what these words would have meant to the Messianic Jewish believers in the church at Ephesus. It's, uh, let's look in the Hebrew Bible, Isaiah chapter 59. And oh, I wish I could, we could just dive into Isaiah today, but then we would have no time. But it is Isaiah, oh, the gospel according to Isaiah. What a beautiful prophecy. So Isaiah 59, and he, meaning God, saw that there was no one and was amazed that there was no one, not one to intercede. So God is, is always on the lookout uh, in developing this, this narrative where there is ultimately going to be this perfect intercessor that will stand between, that will intercede. And some show up, but they're not quite the one. And Moses, oh, he was really close. But no, Moses was not the perfect intercessor. Uh, neither David. David, David, definitely not the perfect intercessor. Solomon, for a while there was like Solomon, he's fulfilling all the prophecies, but no, he's not the perfect intercessor. So he saw there was no one, not one to intercede. Then his own arm brought salvation to him. So it's like God saying, I'll do it. I'm going to be the intercessor that I require. And his righteousness upheld him. And listen, so as he's getting ready to do this, he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing, vengeance against the spiritual powers. And he wrapped himself with zeal as a cloak do you think Paul is not in any way referring to Isaiah 59 when he talks about God's armor? Okay, Isaiah 49. Listen to me, you islands. Pay attention, you peoples from afar, far away peoples. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named me. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. This is imagery that happens multiple times in the scriptures where the words are like a sword that, cut through uh, nonsense, spiritual nonsense. He says, it is, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob to restore the protected ones of Israel. So chosen people, Israel, right? Jews. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So here we have both Jews Jews and Gentiles. We have those who are near, those who are far away. Paul's so keyed into this. So then a shoot will spring, this is Isaiah 11 now, from the stem of Jesse. This is a messianic prophecy if there ever was one. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. And then we have uh, a group of verses, a group of lines that are all about the spirit being in him. Verse three, he will delight in the fear of the Lord and he will not judge by what his eyes see or make decisions by what his ears hear, but with righteousness, with fairness, he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. This is breath is what happens when you speak, of course. And also righteousness will be the belt around his hips and faithfulness, the belt around his waist. So one of the things that you will notice that has happened is we have these character traits that are connected to pieces of armor and clothing, but they don't match completely like 
line for line all the time with what Paul is doing in Ephesians chapter six. And that's how it works. Um, we are not supposed to marry our minds that, well, no, you can't have the belt of righteousness. That's the breastplate. Or, you know, no, 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 no. The shield has always got to be faith. The shield can never be salvation. That's not what's going on here. Uh, we can't be too married to the metaphors that Paul will use at one time or another. In fact, he himself uh, will use a different character trait for the same piece of armor. He did it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. He said, but since we are of the day, not of the night, let's be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love. So the breastplate doesn't always have to be righteousness. So I just want you to get that. We're talking about metaphors of character traits that God wants us to see. So to a Messianic Jewish believer who's, list, who's reading Ephesians chapter six or listening to it being read, or to a Gentile believer who's really been catechized in the Hebrew Bible. So they're basically a Messianic Jew. This armor of God is armor that God himself wears. It's God's armor. It's not just armor from God. This is God's wardrobe, right? The armor that God wears, metaphorically. His character attributes in action to destroy his enemies. And it actually might have even been a little disorienting for them to hear Paul saying that, you know, the armor God wears, you need to take it and wear it. It's like, ooh, can you do that? <laughs> I mean, it's God's armor. Can we wear his armor? Uh, to, to a Messianic Jew, be like, whoa, yeah, that's intense. I think we just take it for granted when we hear it. Oh, the armor of God. But this is going into God's closet, right? And saying, I'll take that. And, I'll, and Paul's saying, do it. So, to the Gentile Ephesians who were not real super familiar with the Hebrew Bible, what would this have meant to them? Now, so we've looked at the, at the Jewish side of the coin. You see it's deeply connected to the Bible. Now what about on the Gentile side of the coin? I wanna talk about the Roman soldiers for a minute and more specifically the Roman legions. I want to first talk about what a Roman, like if you were going into, let's say you're a, Germanic warrior in ancient times. And you know, you're all, you've got your animal skin and you're painted blue and you're just all, you're about a foot and a half taller than the average Roman. And you're riding out there going and you're coming up against the Romans. Let me tell you what you would not see. And I think we have a slide, the picture of Roman soldier. Yep, keep going, yeah. So that is actually historically accurate uh, portrayal of the armor that soldier would wear, except the shield would probably be a little bit bigger, a few minor differences. But if you're a Germanic warrior coming up against, you would not see that. In fact, if you did see that, you would be like, yes, this is gonna be a good day. Because a Roman soldier all decked out in armor has virtually no chance no matter how well trained they are, against these powerful barbarians that have been fighting their whole lives. Virtually no chance. But sadly for you as the uh, barbarian warrior, that is not what you would see. This is actually what you would likely see. Uh, there's another picture, I know we're skipping ahead, yep. So that's what you're facing. Let's be super clear. The armor of God is not intended for single combat use. The armor of God is intended for use as a unit. There was a time, actually, okay, so this is how Rome basically defeated almost everybody. They fought as a unit. There is a, an incident that occurred, I think it was in 9 AD. Is it 9 AD or 9 BC? Uh, it's called the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, so it wasn't even really a battle. The Romans had three legions up there in Germany. They were just, you know, defeating like crazy because they fought as a unit. The Roman legion was almost invincible. And the Germans had a spy in the Roman camp. It was a German leader named Arminius. We don't know what his German name was. 
but he had like gone over to the Romans. They had a lot of people like that. And, but he was really not, he was like, yeah, he wasn't really Romans for the Romans. He was for his own people. So he worked out a plan and convinced the Romans that there was a skirmish, there was some rebellion in a small town and that they could easily defeat it and then just grab a whole bunch more territory. So, but to get there, they had to go through this winding route that spread them out. So they were almost in single file and spread out sometimes 20, 30 feet apart, not in formation. And that's when they were ambushed. And over a period of a couple of days, they were completely wiped out. Three legions, three legions were destroyed. They were just as powerful. There were just as many of them. They had all their armor with them. They weren't together. And when a Roman army tried to fight individually, there was almost no chance. Um, so second part of their strategy is that they stood. They stood. Now you would think that standing is like a defensive posture as we're just holding our ground. But the Romans learned through horrible, terrible experience that that's actually how they won offensively. So uh, I would think, I wish I could give you the details of this battle and draw it all out for you, but we'd be here for a couple of days. But there was, have you ever heard of Hannibal? Anybody? Okay, not just Hannibal Lecter in the movies. <laughs> so Rome is a republic. They're powerful. They're conquering territory. But they had this great enemy the Car of Carthage, the Carthaginians. And uh, the Carthaginians warrior hero emerged in the second war they fought with them. And his name was Hannibal Barca. And he's the guy that brought the elephants over the Alps and just surprised them. Well, so, but nevertheless, the Romans have their, their legion and they fight together and they're virtually invincible. Hannibal knows this. So what he would do is Hannibal would set up his army, which is usually had far less people in it. And he would set them up on the perfect ground for his purposes, perfect setup, and then goad the Romans to attack him. So he would have control over the situation. And he kept beating them. Till finally, the Romans amassed 86,000 of their, you know, key soldiers, super well-trained, decked out in all their armor against 50,000 that Hannibal had. And Hannibal set himself up ahead of time on this river. He picked the terrain. And he, he modified his formation in such a way that the Romans are like, oh man, all we got to do is attack. We've got almost double what he has. We can just squash this bug once and for all. And they, and anyway, they had two generals. One general was in charge one day, the other general the other day. Well, the general the, one day was kind of cautious saying, I don't think we should do this. The other one's like, let's get him. People are at home are saying, we well, finally win a battle. So they attacked, they attacked. And um, Hannibal, without going into too much detail, which I would love to, Hannibal had set the perfect trap. And he was able through the Romans' own advance to gradually encircle the Roman army and killed almost uh, every one of those 86,000 men. I think, I think 14,000 escaped, but yeah. So the Romans learned a lesson, which is, don't fight on the enemy's terms. Set up on the terrain you pick, stand next to each other, don't break formation, and wait. And if you gotta wait for days for the enemy to lose patience and finally attack you, wait days, wait weeks, wait months, whatever it takes. Don't fight on their terms, stand. And when they did this, which they virtually always did, especially after that little lesson at, at the Battle of Cannae, no matter who attacked them, they were virtually invincible. They were like a meat grinder. They had multiple rows of soldiers that would replace each other as fresh soldiers in a checkerboard pattern. So that, you know, somebody's attacking, they might manage to wear out one soldier, but then he's replaced by somebody fresh and no enemy could withstand this because they did it together. Stay in formation, protect each other, reinforce each other. So, with this in mind, 
chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that y'all will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. A few points uh, that we just need to look at. First of all, we're not operating in our strength here. We're operating in his. Whose armor is it? It's God's. It's not our armor. It's his armor that we're wearing. And it, his armor is his character traits that are meant to destroy his enemies. And who are we standing against? We're standing against the schemes of the devil. And this is the first time in the whole book of Ephesians that the devil is, is named. Talks about the powers, talks about wickedness and evil, talks about the spiritual forces. But this is the first time the word devil is used. And those schemes occur when the opposing general can't wait any longer because they've lost their patience and directs the forces to attack. Big mistake. And stand firm. As you can see, this is not a defensive strategy. It's an offensive strategy in a defensive posture. So Clinton Arnold, who's been one of our favorite theologians to quote in this series, has something to say here. He says, it is vital to understand our new identity in Christ at a deep level and to live out of that identity as a means of overcoming the impact of various forms of demonic assault. One of Paul's primary concerns in this letter has been to establish these believers firmly in an understanding of their new identity in Christ. Because of the redemptive work of Christ, our adoption as God's children, his sealing of us with his Holy Spirit, and our future as God's inheritance, we are entirely new people. We are no longer dead in our sins and alienated from God. We've also been brought into a new community or this new society, and we form a spiritual temple that God indwells by his Spirit. Each of the pieces of armor unpacks some aspect of this new identity and should be interpreted by what Paul says earlier in the letter and in his other letters on that theme. This is true of each implement, truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, salvation, the word of God. Putting on the armor of God is thus comparable to what Paul has called the readers to do earlier in the letter when he instructed us to put on the new self that was created in the likeness of God and righteousness and holiness of truth. So putting on the armor is another way of talking about putting on this new self, this new humanity. Okay, verse 12 really informs how we need to understand a major part of the armor of God. Paul writes, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenlies. So when he says we don't struggle, the word that he uses there is taken from, uh, it's a word that's used for wrestling a lot in the ancient Greek. So he's saying we're not wrestling against humans. We don't struggle against humans. In fact, we struggle, and the reason is because we struggle for humans. Even the ones who are being used by the enemy as cannon fodder for his purposes. That's, that's not the enemy. The person isn't the enemy. These are people that Jesus is working to redeem. So God's armor is not to be used against people that he's trying to save, right? We don't fight against them. Think of like, think of you're a part of an allied army and then maybe there's a Nazi army on the other side of, of this ridge and in the middle is this town full of people that's occupied by the enemy and they're supplying food because they have to, um, to the enemy forces. So what do you do? Do you direct your bombs against the people you're trying to rescue? No, not, not in God's army. Those are the people you're trying to save. You're trying to free the village. You're trying to liberate it, not destroy them. So you attack the actual enemy. In this case, the actual enemy is not human beings at all. It's spiritual forces. 
spiritual forces. So rulers, it's the word archai in Greek. Paul's, this is his common expression for demons. He's talking about the demonic hierarchy. Um, powers, exousia, another word sometimes translated authority. So remember how when he talks about the powers, he's talking about the spiritual demonic forces pulling the strings, but also the human institutions, not the flesh and blood people, but the institutions that they are behind. So that's exactly what he's talking about here. The world forces of this darkness, cosmocratores, which is actually, I think, the only time this word appears in the New Testament or in any Greek literature. It's like Paul has said, I need a word here to explain this. So I'm gonna just put two words together that don't normally go together to get this concept across. Paul is inventing language. These are the cosmic rulers <clears throat> by extension, the religious allegiance of this dark world to the cosmic rulers. It's like, it's like the allegiance of earth and heaven in, in hell. It's the hellish allegiance. So, and then he says the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly. So he's just now covering everything. This means any hostile spirit at all inhabiting the spiritual realm. These are our enemies. These are our enemies. Michael Heiser writes, if you wanna have a bunch of sleepless nights, read his work, The Unseen Realm. <laughs> he also has a little more accessible book. It's similar in content called Supernatural. Unseen Realm is kind of more academic. It'll still keep you up at night. Um, we have all likely heard the verse where Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. But put in the context of this other New Testament language, which in turn is informed by the Old Testament imagery of the tabernacle and the temple, it means that wherever believers are and gather, the spiritual ground they occupy is sanctified amidst the powers of darkness. If we could see with spiritual eyes, we would see a world of darkness peppered with the lights of Yahweh's presence, spreading out to meet each other, inexorably pressing and spreading out to take back the ground of the disinherited nations from the enemy. Of course, we would also see those lights surrounded by darkness. The imagery requires perspective. At one time, this is before Jesus, not long ago, there was one light meandering its way through the domains of hostile gods. That light nearly went out, scattered all parts of the known world in tiny embers. But then another solitary but great light shone in darkness. This is Jesus. That light would turn the darkness into light and the nations would be drawn to it. The New Testament portrayal of the spiritual war doesn't hide the task from the reader. The people of God in whom is the name, the presence of Yahweh are surrounded as they have been before. The apostles understood that, but were not faint of heart. There would be no surrender of holy ground in the midst of darkness. Some of the things they taught early believers to observe, in fact, commemorated the unseen conflict raging around them. Everyone had to choose a side. Long quote, I thought it was useful. Verse 13, therefore, this is what you're supposed to do. Y'all, remember, this is y'all, this is not just individuals. There's nothing wrong with us individually putting on the armor of God in the morning. I know people do that and it's, it's awesome. But remember that that armor is not just there for yourself. Armor is there to help protect the people around you. We're putting the armor on together. So therefore, take up the full armor of God so that y'all will be able to resist on the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm. So, the therefore is referring to because of all these spiritual forces that are arrayed against us, you need to take up the full armor of God, meaning it would be foolish to go into battle without wearing Yahweh's armor. These spiritual beings have been around a long time. They have fought many battles. They know how to fight. Why would you go to battle against them without Yahweh's, God's actual armor on you? so that y'all may be able to resist on the evil day. What's the evil day? Two-week lesson. <laughs> it's what the evil day is. Day of the Lord, sometimes 
is referred to as evil day or evil day, the day of the Lord. It is a particular day in the future. It's also a day that is soon coming and all the days in between. Um, this is how Hebrew prophecy works, is there is this ultimate reality to these prophets uh, that are pointing to. There's also usually something right around the corner and it also is meant to kind of ripple between the thing that's happening soon and the thing that will happen eventually. So evil day is this day that is evil and the ultimate evil day to come and everything in between. And having done everything, that means to both prepare for and accomplish with, says to stand firm. So when we have picked the right terrain, like good soldiers are supposed to do, when we are in formation with each other, not breaking ranks, when we are fighting the correct enemy and not like, you know, the poor townspeople, when we're reinforced and protected by one another, and when we are properly outfitted with Yahweh's war equipment, there will be no thought of retreat. This kind of stand can't be defeated. So he says, stand firm, therefore, having belted y'all's waist with truth. We're getting into the armor here. So he says, this is the word stand. He says this word four times now. When that's not just redundancy. When a biblical author, especially Paul, but when a biblical author, any biblical author, repeats a word, especially in a short period of time, that is for a reason. It's supposed to stand out to us. It's supposed to remind us that something important is happening here. It's the fourth time. This emphasizes the strategy. Don't break formation and lose patience and fight on the enemy's terms. Okay, belted y'all's waist with truth. Now this is, this is the item on which the sword hangs. That's where you put the sword, you put, put it on the belt. So if we have lifestyles and interactions that are based on falsehood and deception, when we reach for the sword, it won't be there because <laughs> there's no belt to hang the sword on. Honesty, even honesty that makes us look bad, will keep that sword handy. Uh, tr and truth, truth protects the legacy of discipleship. I wanna show you what that means. If you look at a picture of the Roman belt, you'll notice that yes, you put things on the belt, but there's also something in the front of the Roman belt that protects some, some very valuable resources. And I think, I think Paul has this in mind too, is that with truth, you have a lasting multi-generational legacy that is protected. And when it's built on lies, it evaporates. And this is all about making disciples, isn't it? Okay, verse 14, second part. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Breastplate protects nearly all vital organs. And we have a photo of Roman, that is a Lorica segmentata, which is a type of Roman armor, it's segmented so that you can move it. Uh, that's reproduction. There are some actual ones they've dug up, but they're very rusty. So I showed you a nice shiny one. This protects virtually all of the basic vital organs here. God's, and this is referring to God's justifying righteousness on our behalf, but it's also referring to a lifestyle of doing right by God and doing right by others because it's not just about receiving, it's also about bearing the fruit of it. So the righteousness of Jesus Christ was imputed to us, it was it was essentially put on us and in us, and it protects us, even though we don't deserve it, from the accusations of the enemy. Why? Because we've been forgiven. Yes, Satan, I did, in fact, do all those horrible things, but, you know, the debt was paid. I have been completely forgiven. But also by doing right by God and people, this whole lifestyle that the new humanity is all about, which has been inaugurated in us, it protects us from the enemy penetrating our formation. Because it's not just about me and my breastplate. It's about the people around me. Fallen soldiers give the powers an opening into our ranks. Verse 15. And having strapped on y'all's feet the preparation of the gospel of peace, uh, legionary footwear was actually studded at the bottom for gripping the ground like cleats. And we have a picture of that too. That's an actual uh, piece of footwear that was dug up. 
and you can kind of see the impressions on the sole underneath. They're like studs uh, so that you can stand your ground. It's really cool. Preparation and steadfastness means that the footwear has to be prepared for steadfast standing. Learning the ways of God by learning the word of God. You all here are putting cleats on your feet, on your shoes, sorry, not on your feet. You're putting cleats on there so that you can stand by being here and learning about God's word. It's so valuable. And, the, and now he calls it the gospel of peace, which I think in the context of armor, it's a pretty cool inversion that peace, shalom in Hebrew, irene in the Greek, it's the critical component for a strategic warfare. Peace is. This means that the good news of Jesus, the forgiveness by the free gift of grace that he offers and the kingdom he has inaugurated and is spreading through his corporate body is a proclamation of peace and reconciliation to all the nations, to all the ethnos is the Greek word for nations, inviting them into the family of God's chosen who are called to bless the peoples of the earth and intercede for them. I love what Daryl Bach says here, but we're gonna skip it for the interest of time. Verse 16, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which y'all will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So meaning in all circumstances. So this shield of faith, let's look what a Roman legionary shield would look like. We've got a picture of it there. It's about the size of a door. <laughs> It's fitted with a metal boss, which can deflect harm, but it can also inflict harm. It protects both the soldier wielding it, but in formation, the soldier to your left is also protected. Specially prepared calfskin acts as kind of a fire retardant. So he's, it's the shield of faith. And what is faith? It is trusting allegiance in Jesus and faithfulness to Jesus. And this is a gift of God, as he said in Ephesians 2, verses eight and nine. What are these flaming arrows he's talking about? Remember where they live. They live in Ephesus. And the cult goddess there, the temple of Artemis is the big deal in Ephesus. Artemis is a huntress. She's a huntress goddess who shot arrows at her enemies. So Paul's explaining that our faithful, trusting allegiance to Jesus will quench whatever temptations to false allegiances, the evil, will shoot. And the evil, it, when he says evil or evil one, some translations say, it's a slot that can be filled by the devil. It can be filled by any of the powers. Uh, it can be filled by the one who's posing as Artemis, demonic power, or sin crouching at the door like Cain was facing in Genesis 4. But trusting faithful allegiance to Jesus is going to quench any attempts to light us up in devotion to false gods meaning sexual indulgence or the love of money or personal ambition or tribalism, divisiveness, hatred, all those idols, false religion. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation, Roman helmet. You can see what it looks like. And the helmet protects the head, of course. And in ancient culture, the head represents the source of life for the body. It's the, where all the life flows down into the body. In ancient culture, it just looked at it that way. So it's a protection of the, of the source of life for the body, and it is salvation. There's a double meaning to this. It's so cool because salvation uh, is both our rescue into God's corporate family, right? We were forgiven purely as a gift of grace by faith, and by grace through faith. But it's also the name of Jesus himself. Yeshua, the Hebrew and Aramaic word for Jesus is just our English translation, means salvation. So our life is protected by Yeshua, by salvation, by Jesus. Jesus is actually the head for the body, the source of the body. He's the source of our life identity and he's the protector of our eternal life. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So the sword that he's almost certainly referring to here it's a, it's a sword that the Romans discovered when they were fighting in Spain uh, by the tribes people there, and they thought this is a really good sword. Machaira is in the Greek, but it's, it's the gladius, 
known to the Romans. In the Hebrew Bible, God's own power or rod in Isaiah 11, it's the sword of his word that comes from his mouth. And when it says word of God here, he uses the word, the Greek word, rhema. Uh, in other words, the physical word that comes from the lung and lips. This is the living application of learned scripture, which reflects the person who is the embodied word, Jesus Christ. What, if it, what, what does this word include of the sword? Right application of scripture, personal presence of Jesus, faithfulness to the wisdom of scripture, a life that reflects the life of Jesus himself. And Jesus used this, obviously, when he was tempted in the desert and kind of did some sword fighting with the devil in Matthew chapter four. Jesus used the scripture in context rightly, even though the devil actually quoted longer scriptures. But Jesus did it right. So verse 18, this kind of wraps up all these armor pieces to help us understand what he's actually talking about. How many of you have taken the Priscilla Shire study on armor of God? So you, you are already here. You know that all of the spiritual warfare is, is a type or it's an enactment of prayer. Prayer is what he's talking about here. He says, with every prayer and request, Pray at all times in the spirit. Every prayer and request, the prayer is the foundational deployment of these weapons. This is what's happening with this armor. And at all, the t all times, not just when we gather, it's good to pray when we gather. Corporate prayer, when we're in each other's presence, is a great thing. But individual prayer is to be seen as a corporate activity. When you pray alone in your room or in your car, you are not to think of yourself as praying out there on your own. You are joined with a network of believers in the spirit and covering others with your shield as you pray. It's so cool. And in the spirit meaning, and the primary meaning here is the constant guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit. Like what Craig Keener says, it says prayer for one another might relate to how the soldiers had to stand together in their battle formation, covering one another by moving as a solid unit. A Roman soldier by himself was vulnerable, but as a unified army, a Roman legion was considered virtually invincible. So with this in view, verse 18, be alert with all perseverance and every request for all the hagios, the holy ones. So knowing that prayer is how this armor is to be deployed, be alert, be watchful. And watchful doesn't mean I'm gonna know exactly how everything's gonna come down over the next 10 years because I've got some special insight and, I, and I've just got it all figured out and I know what's gonna happen. It means prayerfulness. The alert warrior is not one who knows what every world event means and how it fits into end times. The alert warrior is the one who's praying, who's actually praying. And for all the hagios, initially in this letter, Paul used hagios to refer just specifically to Messianic Jewish believers like himself and other apostles and other people who are probably in the church at Ephesus. But now having explained how both Jews and Gentiles are united into a living temple, he labels them both hagios here, set apart ones, the chosen. How many of you watch The Chosen, enjoy that series, The Chosen? Yeah, the chosen are the people that are picked out by Jesus in that series. I don't know if you've picked up on that yet. Chosen isn't Jesus. It is, but the chosen are these ragtag people. Us. Okay. Verses 19 through 20. And pray in my behalf that speech may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So he wants all of these hagios to pray for him, that he would say the right things. Paul's asking for wisdom in his speech. We're saying the right thing in the wrong way. As we've discussed before, it could lead to a charge of social terrorism and to the quenching of the gospel. He's like, God, pray for me, guys. Make known with boldness the declassified plans of the gospel. So even in intimidating situations, including he's got this trial coming up with the emperor Nero. He's got this coming. 
Paul wants to relate the true account of the Messiah, his death, his resurrection, the gift of salvation, and the plan for Jews and Gentiles to come together as God's kingdom, for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Well, here he is. He's an emissary from God Most High, and he's made most effective through this upside-down warfare. He's, he's a prisoner. In our weakness, he's strong. In chains, Paul is the lieutenant general. So cool. That I may speak boldly as I ought to. And he wants, this is what he wants the Ephesians to actually pray. Let brother Paul speak boldly as he ought to, Lord, in Jesus' name. So this prayer for Paul is the armor of God in practical application. Armed like this and battling like this in prayer, the implicit idea is that the cosmic power appointed to the Roman Empire will be destroyed when it breaks upon the ranks of the church, unified, standing side by side. And as the powers fall in battle, the flesh and blood Romans will be one for the kingdom of Yahweh. All right, so... Uh, let's see if we have any reflections from our amazing table here. And thank you guys for coming on, on a, sitting at this table on a night where we're talking about this deep subject. Really appreciate you so much. And what do you think? Any thoughts? I think right now, um, especially in today's age, this is such an important reminder for believers. Um, it's so easy to to turn on the news, to turn on the TV and see people committing acts of evil. It's easy to, you know, people are being divided. There's so much division right now. Um, and it's easy to say, oh, this side is evil, this side is evil, mm. what they believe is evil. Um, but the importance of remembering that our struggles are not against these people. They're, you know, are, they're, they're not against flesh and blood. And this this reminder, I think, is just, critical right now for us. Yeah. But they're the ones doing the stuff that we can see, right? I mean, doesn't it make sense to really focus our attention on the flesh and blood? Deception. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's counterintuitive, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It was really, my attention was called to um, when you explained the belt of truth around your waist, mm. which um, is the, in the Greek, it's osphus, which is also mm -hmm. used as loins, and we know that right. that's a um, a word, alternative word, used for your reproductive power. Right. In fact, King James even says, "And gird it's your loins." Your loins. With, yeah. Exactly. King James, you got it right, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and from the Jewish perspective, it's yeah, it's sexual, but it's also your legacy. Yeah. It's also your generations. So, it, it, I was thinking that Paul must have had in mind what he just said in chapter five when he said you know um of sexual imp imm imm immorality and impurity these things should not even be mentioned among you mm -hmm. so they shouldn't be mentioned it's it's like that power of truth and here is the alternative yeah. it's that preservation of your integrity but also the preservation of you, the generations you know to yes. the purity of your next generation yep. through truth that's what's going to guide you and protect your children yeah. I, I just thought it was such a beautiful tapestry. I love that. I think you're exactly right. Yeah, I think so. Other thoughts? I, I was reading um, just yesterday, I was drawn to Proverbs 10, where it talks about um, love covers a multitude of sins. Mm. And in the translation I was reading, it was love overtakes and overwhelms mm. you know, the sin by overcoming it with love, which is not just, because without that explanation, it was more like a, just an enduring picture. I would just endure it. I wouldn't yeah. respond. But instead, actively loving the person who hates you. It's a lot like warfare. Because I really don't want to do this right now, <laughs> right? Exactly. Right. I mean, when somebody's just straight up evil in your face and saying things, and and you know, like that one example you gave about how to do, um, how to agree with someone who's attacking you, yeah. and, and show love in that moment. Yeah. So someone's attacking. Yeah. Um, loving your enemy is much easier said than done. But it is the, uh, 
it, it is the weapon of mass destruction against the forces of hell. It feels good if, you can pull it off. if you can pull that off, they have no defense. Yeah, talking about the uh, demonic powers. They have no defense against that. And I think how prayer comes in at the end of this yes. cha you know, chapter, he talks about you got to pray, you know, pray always and pray. And I'd like your, I underlined it here, pray should, prayer should primarily be an act employed for the benefit of others. Yes. And I think of how prayerless we are much of the time, you know, yeah. that we, we're not to be. We have to be prayerful people. That is our battle. That's how we fight our battles is yeah. in prayer and how easy it is not to pray, you know. Not to go yeah. to corporate prayer, not to, you know. Yeah. Prayer, it's so central. So what you said reminded me, I mean, the Jesus Creed um, is to love God and, and love people. It's like the, we even made a t-shirt, right? Um, that is the Jesus Creed. And that creed should be employed in prayer to love God during our prayer and thanking him and just adoring him and then lifting up the needs of others around us. And it's just so easy to slip into that mode of just praying for my needs and my requests and I got this coming up, Lord. And, and that's okay, he wants to hear those things. I mean, he cares deeply, we're, we're his children. But I think if we employ that Jesus Creed, um, you know, the two most important things that Jesus said and that sum up the whole law, Paul said, you know, love your neighbors yourself is, is it. If we employ that in prayer, how effective is that warfare going to be? Yeah, it's his character. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, that's exactly right. So th this was, um, I don't know how I want to say this. This is a, this, this passage takes a, it requires a, a, almost a paradigm shift in your thinking when you're talking about battle and warfare from a man's perspective because it's when you read this <clears throat> and guys you know you got to back me up here <laughs> you can't tell a man to get ready for battle and then not move yeah 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 so if 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 i'm being called to fight my first thought is i'm attacking yes not standing still and right. defending. Defense will be part of it, but it's not like I'm never going to not attack at some point. That's right. And so, and then when you read about the armor and what it represents, and essentially his armor, every piece of his armor is a is a description of his character. And then you translate that into okay, this is really how am I supposed to act, as opposed to you know, they're just, yeah. you know, describing it in clothing or things that you would put on because it appeals to the mindset of, at least from a man's perspective, I can relate to going to battle. Right. I, mean, I can relate to Put on the bulletproof the vest. Yeah. Warrior mentality, I can, I can relate to that. Um, weapons, all that stuff. And that excites me. Yeah. But then don't tell me to not move. Yeah. And that's, and that, it's exactly what, like, all the barbarians of the world in ancient times, I mean, they were raised in this culture of attack. You know, like, we understand. And so they see these Romans standing there. They're attacking. And then they get demolished because the Romans are disciplined. They know they're going to win if they stand, if they don't move until it's time to move. And that's how they conquered all this vast territory. So. So thank, hey, can we give thanks to everyone who's participated in the table? Next week, we're doing something different, so we don't have a table, but I just love you guys. Your insights have been astounding. So I don't know, we might have a question or two that I'm happy to answer. Before we All right, question or two. Elijah prayed to open his servant's eyes so he would see the chariots of fire and horses on the hills that surrounded them and God's enemy. Is that relevant to our battle that bolsters our faith and confidence in God's armor and provision for us today? Yeah, uh, yes. So uh, 
relating a story in, in Kings where, uh, yeah, Elijah was with a student of his servant who, I mean, they're surrounded by, their prophetic school is surrounded by uh, enemies from Syria. And the servant's like, what are we gonna do? He's like, Lord, open his eyes. And then he sees the angelic hosts that are surrounding them. So that was an apocalypse. That was an unveiling of the servant's eyes. So Paul is giving us an apocalypse here by explaining this is what's really going on in the spirit realm. We're not fighting people. Have eyes open to see that these character traits that are so valuable, this is God's armory through which we are actually going to fight the spiritual forces of darkness. So yeah, it's a similar Lord, open their eyes, and we're going to try to explain it to them. That's a real, whoever asked that, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant question. And then Jesus is living logos in John's gospel. Are you able to expand on rhema and logos? Oh, yeah. So I, there's a whole bunch of ink that's been spent on trying to explain the exact differences between the Greek word for word rhema and the Greek word for word logos. Uh, but... Uh, the more and more I read and study and look at, look at this, I think there, there's obviously a distinction between the two, but I don't think we should just totally separate them. Uh, rhema is used in Greek to talk about the, phys, the, the act, the word that comes from your lungs and, and the breath that comes out of your mouth and the thing that you hear. And logos is more like the, the uh, embodiment of that whether it's written or whether it's the concept of the word that exists outside of you speaking it. So they're obviously strongly related to each other. I, I've, I've just learned not to make too much of the differences between them. But ask me again in five years, I might change my mind. Okay, last question. So what will be the next Bible study? Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, June 15th. We are going to start a seven-week study, and there will be a certificate for this seven weeks as well. Um, and it can be a combination of online and, and in-person uh, to take it. We are going to have the sign-ups starting next week, and it will be on the Book of Ruth. It'll be on the Book of Ruth. Uh, we're very, very excited to teach that, and uh, you'll be very happy to know that I'm, I'm going to be teaching it, but also with help. Uh, from Pastor Alex. So the two of us will are just very, very excited to present this to you. I think that after you're done with Ruth, you are gonna see Ruth in just like a goosebump kind of light, like you've never seen it before. So thank you, Mariette, and thank all of you. Thank you, Pastor Tim. All right, so for those that came in late, please go to the back if I don't know whether you'd like a paper or electronic certificate, just so I can be ready for next week if possible. If you know anybody that was not here, please let them know. And then we're just gonna close in prayer tonight. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the lessons that you've taught us. We thank you for Pastor Tim's just commitment to the class and to teaching us. Let your word, Lord, really come in, into our hearts, that we not take this lightly, that we witness what is um, before us in a way that you would have us to witness it, Lord, that we see people as your children and to be rescued, and that we battle against the spiritual, not against people. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.